Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is obviously October the 18th. I've lost track of which Sunday of streaming it is. Um, my dear sister-in-law, Margie, let, sent me a text a little while ago to say that we would have some competition for our streaming this morning because apparently our premier is speaking at 11 o'clock to a press conference which will let us know exactly what restrictions are going to be eased and which are not. So thank you to all of you who are still being strong enough to and disciplined enough to watch the streaming right on 11 o'clock. But all of you who watch whenever you do are most welcome. Um, those of you who are in Australia will know that our numbers in Victoria have dropped very pleasingly the last few days. We are sad for those of you who watch afterwards from the Northern Hemisphere because we know that is not the case there. And um, as I said to someone today who had strong views about what should and shouldn't happen, I'm past having strong views and whenever I feel angry with politicians or public servants who seem to have made mistakes, I try instead to pray for them that they will be guided because I would not know what way to lead a community through this virus until a vaccine is found and if a vaccine is found that really gets on top of it. And we know that the Americans have now assured their president that there will be no vaccine hurrying up to be ready in two weeks. And some people here are talking about late next year, so we will see. But um, we are grateful to have so much and our hearts go to those who have so little. Um, apart from watching the daily numbers, while well, we've been doing the usual things, enjoying some spectacular viewing that um, is available during the pandemic, realising how little we know about areas of history we thought we were quite well informed about. So there has have a lot, a lot of good things have been offered to us, even during the hard times. And I'm going to hand over to Graham now. Thank you, Christine. Warm welcome to everybody to our stream service this morning at Blackburn Presbyterian Church. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll linger and uh, leave evidence of your time with us, perhaps by a comment in the, uh, in the Facebook page or uh, some communication through the web page, depending whichever way you've visited us this, this morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we, we love to uh, connect with you one way or another, and so hope that you will leave evidence of your presence. The leaflet this morning, uh, contains an outline of the sermon and uh, you'll see it's uh, also available for download from the web page if you wish to have a copy of that and it contains some of the things that we pray for regularly people and places so uh, warm welcome our stream service is uh, continuing the series on great texts of the bible um, i wasn't quite sure whether to ring rain to pull it in before uh, uh, much longer, but I would think I'm going to keep it going till Advent now. There are just so many texts that came, seem to keep coming to mind as, uh, as I think about it. So with uh, that said, let's begin with uh, a short prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that around the world Christian people can unite in uh, worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, not merely by acts of devotion, by uh, the praises of their hearts, the words of their lips, and by the lives they live. We pray that you will help us all to be one in our testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray that even though we are apart in this service, we pray that you will join us together so that we might unitedly live to your praise and glory. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Amanda is going to play for us. I've uh, put the name of the piece on the, on the screen, but I'm sure you can recognize this without any help. Thank you, Amanda. We do so appreciate how you enhance our services every week. It really is great. Okay, well, Young at Heart, and we're this today I'm talking about back on track. But first of all, I want to show you a photograph, <coughs> which I think will be familiar to all Australians certainly those on the east coast yes those awful bushfires shane fitzsimmons in this photograph was the commissioner of the new south wales fire, rural fire service between september 2007 and april this year i found shane very impressive for his honesty when things are bad i'd rather be told they were bad and know that someone taking them seriously is in control. He seemed able to keep cool even when it seemed to us and probably to him that the whole of New South Wales was burning and of course eventually Victoria too was hit. This sort of unflappability of Shane was confirmed when we saw an Australian story 30-minute program about him. This week we were again reminded of the awful bushfires of last summer, well really they started last spring didn't they, when we watched the first of three programs featuring big weather events and encouraging people 
to be prepared for them, as the expectation is that there will be more. I knew that Shane had left the fire service because that came out in the Australian Story episode, but I'd forgotten what he'd done. And he actually now is Head of Resilience New South Wales. Now, I have to read what that organisation is. We are the lead disaster management agency for New South Wales, responsible for all aspects of disaster recovery and building community resilience to future disasters. Now, typically for Sheen, it wasn't in the very dramatic and very good programme about big weather events that he came back into my mind. But it was hearing him comment on a movement called Backtrack, which is helping troubled young people and at the same time victims of bushfires in quite an amazing and I found very moving way. Shane said of these young people, they are doing remarkable work. They're doing work that makes a genuine and sincere difference in the lives and livelihoods of people right across New South Wales. As Australians will know, um, farmers in many parts of Australia have experienced four years of drought. And then came the bushfires, and then came floods, and then came COVID. So they're doing it very hard, and depression is a huge problem for many of these people. Now, if we could move to the next photograph, it's of a couple of these farmers who've lived in Nowendock, which is southeast of Tamworth, for more than 50 years. But they said they've never seen anything like the fire that raced towards their home late last year. Their home survived, but the damage to their property was extensive. There was nothing but ash and burnt trees and fire. Nothing, absolutely nothing, Kath says. And she says that her husband, Al, was very depressed. The task seemed too much. A group of young men from this organisation, Backtrack, replaced 2.3 kilometres of fencing, a very significant amount of fencing. And Al then commented, the fact that the fence is completed, it means I can do other jobs and rely on that fence to be there to be stock proof, so keep stock in and unwanted animals out. And I can just factor that into our working, which is a huge benefit to us and such a relief. At the end of this talk, which we've posted on the website, there's a link to, that will show you what Backtrack is doing on devastated farms. And we also, this week, watched a documentary called Backtrack Boys, which you can rent from Google for three ninety nine. And the, yeah, so those of you who want to know more can look at that. I just thought I would mention the three aims the founder of this group has. This is Bernie Shakeshaft. And I realised as I looked into Backtrack that, yes, I'd heard about him because he lives in Armadale, where we lived in the 70s and where four of our children were born. And he was Australian Local Hero of the Year for this year. His three aims, excuse me, his three aims, he said, are to keep these tr troubled young people alive, keep them out of prison, and then help them discover and pursue their dreams. The, the, he uses dogs a lot, and those of you who are animal lovers will really love this aspect of his work, that troubled young people 
and I'm sure some of you have seen this with people you know and love, the relationship with a dog can be transformational. transformational. Um, and now I'll just show you a photograph of three of these young men. We couldn't find one of them actually with the fence they had replaced at Nowing Dock. But here you can see them with their tools, looking very happy and very pleased with themselves. As I thought about all this, I thought of how many texts in the Bible focus on the value of work. And we'll now have a photograph. You shall eat the labor of your hands. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. And these young men who thought they were useless are discovering that by doing work, helping people, having people tell them they matter and they're doing something, something valuable is having wonderful results. I also thought of how God doesn't give up on us. If anyone in the Bible could be described as an at-risk young person, surely it was the prodigal son. Yet, look at how he was welcomed back by his father when he decided to change his ways. We should all be praying for groups like Backtrack, for the exhausting and sometimes unrewarding work of those who run it, and whenever the opportunity arises, may we offer a helping hand to anyone who crosses our path and needs a hand up to get back on track and to stay there. May God bless them and us. Thank you, Christine. Now we're going to uh, turn to the Bible, and I'm going to read the Bible today. The Bible passage is John 17, and uh, this is the prayer that Jesus prayed on his last night with the disciples. Uh, from chapter 13 to chapter 17 of John's Gospel, we have the discourse and the final prayer of Jesus with his disciples. It begins, you might remember, with the foot washing. There's beautiful material in these chapters. But I've chosen this prayer because it's the fullest expression of Jesus at prayer that we have anywhere. Although we know uh, from many instances and references to him praying, we don't have the content of his prayer. But here we do. And so I'm going to read to you from John 17, I'll read the first uh, nine verses and then from verse 20 to the end. After Jesus had finished saying this, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son so that the Son may give glory to you. For you gave him authority over all mankind so that he might give eternal life to all those you gave him. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ whom you sent. I have shown your glory on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. Father, give me glory in your presence now, the same glory I had with you before the world was made. I have made you known to those you gave me out of the world. They belonged to you, and you gave them to me. They have obeyed your word, and now they know that everything you gave me comes from you. I gave them the message that you gave me, and they received it. They know that it is true that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you gave me for they belong to you. And then there's a passage where Jesus reflects on that. And then I want to pick it up at verse 20. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. 
I pray that they may all be one, Father. May they be in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one, so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. Father, you have given them to me, and I want them to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me, for you loved me before the world was made. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know you, that you sent me. I made you known to them, and I will continue to do so, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and so that I also may be in them. Amen. And may God give us understanding uh, of this uh, prayer and lead us more deeply into its secrets. Amen. Well, great texts of the Bible. I don't know if you noticed when I held up the order of service earlier that I've chosen the uh, statue of Christ that uh, uh, is, has been erected over the city of Rio de Janeiro as, as a, a, a reminder for the theme of this week. Uh, the uh, statue is of, of Christ the Redeemer and he has his arms outstretched. It's a massive statue. I, I read that uh, real estate prices in Rio de Janeiro are more expensive if you can see this statue from your house. I don't know if that's superstition or just the advantage of a room with a view. But there you have it. And I, I think that since this prayer takes us into the future, into a future that uh, was 2,000 years on from the time of the prayer when this statue was built, that it, uh, it can speak to us. John 17, Jesus at prayer. So this beautiful and poignant chapter brings together the themes of the whole of John's gospel. And I want to illustrate that at the start and then move on to some other points uh, from the prayer. An early commentary last century said, No attempt to describe the prayer can give a just idea of its sublimity, its pathos, its touching yet exalted character, its tone at once of tenderness and triumphant expectation. One gets the impression that it was so sacred to the disciples that they knew it. They memorized it. They probably put it together as they discussed things afterwards. You get the sense that they've also prepared it for use by believers because the expression uh, Jesus the Messiah in, in verse uh, 3, I think it is, uh, that, that seems to be an insertion. Jesus himself would almost certainly not have said Jesus the Christ but perhaps alluded to himself, and it's been emended to make it quite clear who we can speak of. So Jesus' teaching has come to a close, and in front of him lies the cross. This very night, he will be arrested. So we've come to the Passion, and it's with that in mind that I want us to look at five segments. The, the, the words I'm using... Uh, to describe it, I've read them to you, I've taken them straight from the text. Firstly, we're going to look at, Father, the hour has come, and then I have made known, and then I pray for them, and then I pray not only for them, and then the love that you have. So uh, uh, six, five ideas there that we can we can look into. And the first of those is the hour has come. This is verses 1 to 5. And I'm going to point you to several things here. Uh, first of all, we, we see Jesus speaking to the Father. A relationship lies at the foundation of true prayer. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, pray like this, our Father. 
So we come as a community to a loving parent, to a father who loves us. And this speaks of the intimacy uh, that from which prayer arises. Jesus' union with the Father, which we uh, saw last week in our uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, the, the, the fact that he had uh, the form of God, but he didn't think his, he should cling to that form of God, but took the form of a servant and humbled himself and became, as it were, a man, uh, not just as it were a man, became a man, uh, and and so that hymn spoke of that this this relationship with the Father. And that's at the basis of prayer. And secondly, I want you to notice the hour. The hour has come. There are time signals all the way through John's Gospel, and this time signal reminds us that Jesus' entire life was, in a way, orchestrated by the Father. If you look at John two chapter four, uh, John chapter two verse four, John seven verse thirty, and chapter eight verse twenty, you'll see that that his teaching, the hour, is mentioned, and the teaching is now done. His arrest is imminent. The hour of his self-giving is at hand. So Jesus is expecting this. He's alluded to it through his ministry, and the hour has now arrived. And then I want to pick up the word, the glory. You know, in, in an era of celebrity, we're inundated with uh, fashionistas and uh, the glitterati from uh, the catwalks of the world to the sporting fields. But John's gospel gives us a new idea about glory. It takes us to another realm altogether. And it does that by taking us both lower and higher at the same time. Consider John chapter 1 and verse 14. This is at the very beginning of John's gospel. John in the prologue says, We have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What did they see in Jesus? Well, they saw love that pursued them. It's true that in John's Gospel, the emphasis is put on, as it were, the, the Father's activity. You gave them to me. But we know at the same time that they received him. As many as received him, to them gave he the authority to be God's children. If you want to read a deep reflection on glory, I would recommend uh, C.S. Lewis's 1942 sermon, sermon delivered in wartime England, uh, on the weight of glory. You can find a PDF of it on the internet if you look for it. Uh, the, the reference is, uh, is in the, uh, the online copy of the, of the notes and you can follow that link if you wish. But it's a, it's a consideration that takes us down but up at the same time. So glory, the weight of glory. Uh, it has to do with the Trinity, Father, Son and Spirit drawing us into God's presence through God the Son among us. There's a beautiful meditation on it by Catherine Lacuna as well in her book, uh, God for Us. So the Father is the relationship at the beginning. The hour has come. The glory is going to be revealed as the Jesus embraces the cross and all that that service for humanity entails. That is the work. The work is Jesus' mission. He left this Father's presence to make the glory known. The passion and the cross are before him. What kind of work is redemption? Well, there's a discussion about this in John's Gospel. These are all key themes in John's Gospel. In, in John chapter 6, uh, they ask, what must we do to do the work of God? And Jesus says, the work of God is to believe on the one he has sent, on the suffering and the serving Son of God. Believe on this one. And then finally, in this first observation about the themes in the gospel and the way Jesus approaches prayer, we have the life. Now, what kind of life is eternal life? This is life eternal that they might know you. What is eternal life? Well, eternal life, we tend to think of it as life going on and on and on forever. And I'm not going to deny that at all. But it's not the primary idea. 
the primary idea in eternal life is qualitative. It's the life of the age to come. You see, Jewish people expected that when God finally put the world to right, there would be a whole new quality of life. And they expected a resurrection at the end of time when that would be be visible to all. What they didn't expect was that God would act before the end to give us a foretaste of that. And that's what we have in the resurrection, the first fruits, as it were, the, the breaking in of God's kingdom. And we, sort of t- we get a taste of the life to come when we see what Christ does as the anointed one. And it's this qualitative difference that it makes. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus. He came that uh, all who received him might have life, may not perish, but have life eternal. And to the woman at the well in the the fourth chapter, Jesus says to her, "From, from the one who believes in me, from him or her, streams of living water will flow. Living water. It's a qualitative change that happens when Christ comes into your life when you receive him, when you discover the Father has given you to him. So this is the introduction to Jesus' prayer. This prayer brings the themes of the gospel together and shows us how they are, they are the foundation on which Jesus has, is progressing to his passion. And then The second phrase, if the first phrase was, Father, the hour has come, the second is this, I have made known. This is in verses 6 to 8. I have made known. Jesus' mission was to embody and to proclaim the message of the Father. Not everyone received it or believed it. He came to his own, says John in the prologue, and his own received him not. What words of tragedy they are. But to those present as he prayed, well, they were the ones who had received him. To as many as received him. He he gave eternal life. He gave the authority to be God's children. They belonged to him because they believed the message. They obeyed the word revealed by Jesus. And the evidence was there in a new relationship with the Father. They too had begun to pray, our Father, to see God in this uh, loving and familial relationship. And in Jesus they encountered God's truth. The truth is personal. We know they believed and we know where it took them. They trusted him and they carried forward his word. They heard him speak of the greatest kind of love. He did that in this very discourse a couple of chapters earlier. He called them friends. He introduced them to the love that uh, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. Now when Jesus does this, I want to suggest to you that Psalm 22 is in his mind. We know that on the cross he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the opening of Psalm 22. And I believe that that was a deep meditative uh, part of Jesus' preparation for, for this moment. And if you read that psalm, and I invite you to do that from verse, read the whole psalm, but pick it up, Pick up from verse 18. It's the cry of a man who is destitute and abandoned. And it goes on to describe extraordinarily, it goes on to describe in detail crucifixion. But then it takes you beyond that from verse 18. There's a triumphant uh, crescendo to the end of the psalm. I will proclaim your name among my brethren. And if you read it, it goes on to say something more by far, which we'll look at in the second half of the psalm. Jesus is anticipating that the work that they have done will be uh, echoing through the years. They heard about his love. I have made it known. Greater love hath no man than this. Jesus' fidelity to the Father's purpose. 
So these are the ones who have heard it and received it. And now we hear him say, I pray for them. Now I, I only stopped at verse 9 and I skipped this uh, section of about uh, nine verses. But I, the content is very precious and important. It's just that in one sermon I didn't think I could do justice to uh, ex, uh, opening this up. I pray for them. But I want to make uh, clear from verses 9 to 19 that this is, this is the body of the prayer for those disciples who had, who had received him. They, they had depended very heavily on his visible presence. We know this, for example, for their, their uh, time in the storm on the lake. Uh, he was sleeping. He needed to be wakened up. His presence was reassuring to them. Uh, and right now they're on the cusp of losing him. He's going to be t taken from them. He's about not only to be uh, under arrest, but what befell him is uh, terrifying and horrible. How would they feel without him and in view of his horrific execution? Now Jesus prays for their safety. Judas has left. It's going to happen now. He doesn't pray for the world. He prays for them. I need to say here that when John talks about the world, he's not primarily thinking of uh, Sir David Attenborough and the wonderful world that we, we explore, uh, the natural world. And he's not primarily thinking of the cosmos uh, and our interest in uh, cosmology and how the earth the world came to be and about an expanding universe and how we know these things he's not interested in 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 those things he's interested in the world in a different way what way is that well it, in john's gospel the world is organized human structures which promote greed oppression and injustice and the disciples relationship with the world is critical for our understanding of this section of the prayer. The prince of this world comes, says Jesus. There is a, there is a this world that rejects him. The love of the Father is not here. The disciples' relationship with the world is important for us. They are strangers and even enemies in the world. Now, armed with the truth as they have seen it in Jesus, they are to embark on the same mission. What will stop them facing the same fate? Their mission is to carry forward his mission. They are to be dedicated and give themselves to God. Verses 17 and 19, to 19, this is spelt out. We know they made mistakes. We have that written in the New Testament. We have them talking together in Acts. They needed to be drawn back again and again to the teachings of the Master. We also know for all their faults that these people that Jesus is praying for changed the world. Perhaps uh, there are numerous books that uh, could, could take you in this direction. One of the most intriguing, I think, is... Uh, Tom Holland's book Dominion, which came out a year or so ago, uh, where he explores his Christian roots without committing himself to them, uh, except in the ethical sense at that stage. But he has, he's writing about the way the teaching of these people, uh, the disciples of Jesus, has impacted the world. So their fears are apparent. Uh, from our knowledge of the ongoing story and in the New Testament, and we know that their message flourished. The story, uh, as far as the New Testament takes it in the book of Acts, is this, that the Apostle Paul was in chains in Rome, but it says, but the word of God is not chained. So there it is. These are the, those for, for whom Jesus is praying, and we know something of the way in which they lived their lives and the the message that they embraced, and we see this as a prayer that they uh, that was answered in in history and in the even in the pages of the New Testament. I pray for them, said Jesus. But he said, I pray not only for them. 
And this is verses 20 to 23. Jesus is looking further ahead. And he's doing this uh, on the basis of that psalm that I alluded to, Psalm 22. If you look at the second half of the psalm, and I've put some of the words on the screen, you'll see that uh, the words in yellow, the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and the families of the nations will bow down before him. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Posterity will serve him. You ask yourself the question, how could Jesus see this far ahead? And I would like to suggest to you that he knew Psalm 22. It was his meditation. The scriptures, of course, he alluded to them again and again, and the Psalms twice as often as, as other books in the Bible. So here we have uh, the Psalm that was perhaps spoke uh, so, so vividly to Jesus uh, at this moment, and it's about posterity uh, entering into the heritage that he's opened up for them. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Now, Jesus is then praying for all who will believe because they have heard the word, even though they've never seen him. Well, if you're a believer today, this takes you in and me. He prays that they will be one with the disciples, that they will have the same faith and the same love. Just as he is one with the Father, and you'll notice the word one is very frequently used here. Sharing the sort of the apostolic DNA generates an organic unity, although not necessarily an organizational unity. Despite various traditions, the current coronavirus pandemic has reminded uh, many of the churches in Whitehorse, and there are uh, the ones that have not got involved are basically churches that we're still to reach because they're working in languages that we don't have much familiarity with. But the, the churches in Whitehorse, trying to keep Jesus at the center and his, his mission to the community, have uh, not only created a new charity to show the, the care of the churches for, for people suffering in the pandemic, it's heightened the resolve of the clergy across all the churches to help shine the light of Jesus into our community. And there are, there are dark corners. The world with its sinful and oppressive structures continues to be of great concern to Christian people. The cover of The Economist uh, news magazine this week features uh, the genocide being waged against the Uyghur people. We've heard of the devastation in Syria and we know that uh, massive numbers of Syrian refugees have uh, got out of Syria any way they could. We know that Lebanon and one of the neighboring countries is, is suffering enormously from instability of government and the presence of refugees and that massive explosion a few weeks ago that was so devastating. We know that we live in a, a troubled and a broken world. We know that Azerbaijan and Armenia are uh, waging war. So The Economist goes on in its article to state that human rights are in decline in 80 of the world's nations. Human rights are in decline in 80 of the world's nations. This week, the Richard Johnson lecture, a lecture in memory of the uh, first public Christian in, uh, after the white settlement of Australia, Richard Johnson, uh, a friend of William Wilberforce and John Newton, that lecture was about human rights and it traced them right back through the New Testament to the uh, idea that human beings are in the image of God and precious. Jesus acted on that. He treated people as precious. So if human rights are in decline, is this a concern of ours? It should be. Are we deaf to the cry of our neighbors? I'm sure we're not. But in what ways can we make our voices heard? Well, that's part of our shared challenge. We need to make it the message of Jesus reach into 
the world's dark corners. Why is it important that we believe the Father sent the Son? Well, this is our final point. Jesus says in verses 24 to 26, it's that the love that you have for me might be known. That there might be this sense of at one, of one spirit. So I would say there are two reasons why it's important. Firstly, as God's wayward creatures, we need to know that our idolatries are deadly. Evil is real and beguiling and it can be packaged, as uh, the New Testament tells us, uh, to look like an angel of light. So we need to be on our guard that some of the things that are advanced uh, might lead in the wrong direction. The human systems and societal structures of this world tend to decay and become corrupted. They easily advance human misery and sorrow. Does that ring true, I ask? Well, we thank God for those structures that don't. How good it was to hear about Backtrack Boys uh, this morning. The second reason we need uh, to make known this love is because the Father is the Lord of life and he yearns for his human family to know and experience love, just as the disciples entered into this wonderful truth. And this is the good news that the love you have for me may be in them, and so that I also may be in them. Verse 26. Ask yourself, how needed in the 21st century is this sacrificial love? Well, let us pray. Let us pray that that sacrificial love will be evident in our needy world and evident in us. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Lord Jesus, our Redeemer and our friend, thank you for the life you lived and the message you shared from the Father. Thank you for bearing your heart on the eve of your passion so vividly that your friends recalled and shared your words with us. As we bow before you now, please grant to us by your Holy Spirit the unity with them that you so desired, so that the world might know that you came from the Father to ensure the loving purpose of God might spill into the lives of men and women, boys and girls, throughout the ages and around the world. We confess our participation in harmful patterns of living, We have sinned in thought, word and deed. We are guilty of sins of commission and omission. Please forgive us and renew a right spirit within us. As we listen to news feeds and explore social media, keep us sensitive to the truth made known through Jesus. We thank you that in Australia, public officials are held to account Thank you that in Victoria the coronavirus infection numbers have been greatly reduced. As we emerge slowly from lockdown, help us to stay wise and gracious, supportive of the elderly, the poor and frontline workers. Keep us mindful in practical ways of the personal and material losses many have sustained, especially where a second wave of infections is rising. We think of India, Iran, the USA, Europe and Britain, and we pray for the many parts of the world where COVID numbers are rising dramatically and dangerously. We thank you for the power of prayer and the generosity of the many voluntary agencies who make this their concern. We too continue to pray for homes and families where there is an increased risk of harm due to the pandemic homes where people are too busy or bored, frenetic or frustrated, ill-tempered or tired. We remember the work among troubled young people and pray for Bernie Shakeshaft and all under his care at Backtrack and for the wonderful beauty of the dogs. Grant that your concerns become our concerns. 
We pray for all who may be troubled by disability or fragile health. Help us to pray, play our part, to comfort the bereaved and speak calm to all who feel insecure and uncertain. Build faith, hope and love in each of us. We grieve for the people who, people at war, torn Syria and the surrounding nations, especially Lebanon. We pray for the, that the fragile peace treaty between Sudan, Sudan, in Sudan will hold and that the people of that troubled nation will know peace and safety. Help Armenia and Azerbaijan to resolve their deadly differences. Lord, have mercy. These things we ask of you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift on you the light of his countenance and give you peace.